we look at global missions and we look at the global and the local, we can see in the missionaries that we support how much goes into behind the scenes uh, as we seek uh, to be a going church that is sending out missionaries and supporting missionaries uh, to bring uh, the gospel to, uh, to the ends of the earth. So um, I want us to keep that in mind as we look at what we're going to look at today is uh, we're going to look at uh, the gospel and we're going to look at the world's need. And we're going to look at how Paul, how he encouraged the people that he was ministering to, to give to meet the needs of those around him. So that's what we're going to be doing a little bit today. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, uh, go ahead and turn to the book of Romans chapter 10. And uh, I'm, I'm going to say a prayer as we, as we center back in on the Word. God, I thank you uh, for the missionaries that you have allowed us to support throughout the world. God, I pray a blessing over them. God, I pray for their health. I pray for their families. I pray for their uh, support. Lord, I pray for the people that they are ministering to. God, that you will um, work, God, in mighty ways to bring so many people around the world uh, to know you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that you will use us as a church um, to, to be a going church that is going into our communities uh, with your gospel, with the light of your love, and that is and that is going into the world as we send out missionaries. In your name we pray, amen. So go ahead and look at the book of Romans chapter 10. All right, now, I, I love the book of Romans. Like This is the Apostle Paul, and he is writing to a church that he has never been there yet, but he wants to go to Rome. And in this book, he is laying out like all of his doctrine. And, and Romans is such, such a beautiful book of the grace that we find in Jesus Christ. And so he has gone through... Um, uh, you know, nine chapters of this. And in chapter 10, uh, we get, I think, what are some of, uh, some of the key verses in Romans as we look at what the gospel is. So let's go ahead and look at what Paul is saying as we explore what God has for us today. So Paul says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. So he says, look, God has sent me to the Gentiles. Like, that's what he told him. Like, I'm going to take Saul and I'm going to send him as a light to the Gentiles and I'm going to show him how much he's going to suffer for my sake. That's what God told Paul. And yet Paul still had a heart for his brothers and sisters uh, as, as the Hebrews, as the Israelites. And he says, my heart is that they would become saved because they have the zeal for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Because you see, they, they are not submitting to the righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus. They are trying to earn their righteousness by the things that they do. Going on, he says, Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. You see, in the Old Testament, we see that righteousness is this. He who keeps the law, that's righteousness. And when we look at because of Jesus Christ and we see the example of Abraham, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. When we look at Jesus dying in our place and we say that's the way to be saved, that's the way to be righteous, our faith is credited to us as righteousness. It's not just the washing away of sins, right? Because if we owed this debt of sin, like we do, if we could put it in financial terms, millions, billions, trillions of dollars, if that was just washed away, do you think we'd get into heaven with just a zero dollar bank account? We need the righteousness of God credited to us. And that comes through faith. So he says, Moses said in the law that the righteous one is the one who does this, okay? But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That's to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Praise the Lord. For there's no difference, Paul says, between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And we say, praise the Lord. Awesome, great, good news. And then he says this. How then can they call on one they have not believed in? 
Then how can they believe in one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You see, y'all are sent. Because there's people in your own lives, live across the street, that your families interact together, that you see at the store, that they do not know the hope that you have. And how can they know if nobody tells them about it? And how can someone tell them about it if they're not sent? Well, here's the thing. In your local communities, y'all, us all, I'm included here. Should I do this? Y'all, like that, maybe? Y'all are sent. We're sent to be good news bearers, to be speakers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because there are people who need Jesus everywhere that we go. Now, as I was praying through this and and, and seeking God, okay, God, how, how do we go through this? He reminded me of a book I read in college called Spirit of the Rainforest, okay? And this is a book about a tribe, I, I believe it's in, uh, it's in the, the Amazon rainforest, I don't remember which country exactly it was in, but it's a Yanomamo people, okay? And we read this in college, and, and here's what these tribal people believed, okay? They knew there was this creative, creator being, supreme overall, that dwelled in a land that was too bright and too hot for them to go to. And they, couldn't, they had no access to him. They knew he existed. They knew he was the supreme being, but he lived in a place that they couldn't go to. It was too bright and too hot. And the only thing that they knew about him, being creator and supreme being, is they also believed that he ate the souls of children. Because they knew that the souls of the kids that died went to his kingdom. They knew that. And so they, they knew about this supreme being, this God who dwells alone in unapproachable, glorious light, but, but he seemed like someone who was an enemy of them. They couldn't get there, and he was the one who was taking the souls of their kids. That's what they believed. And what they knew was is that there was all these other spirits. These spirits were not supreme, but they were powerful. And these spirits had their own leader who was very powerful, not as powerful as this supreme being. And their whole life was about living in a way to appease these spirits so that they would be protected from other spirits. Their whole life was lived in fear of, I've got to do these things in order to appease this spirit and this spirit and hope that these spirits are stronger than this spirit that our enemies are trying to appease. And there was all this warfare that showed up in a physical way, but it was also a spiritual warfare with the witch doctors and the things that they were doing. And one day, a missionary came into their context. And it wasn't just short and sweet like that. But a missionary came in and the missionary was able to explain to them that this being that they knew out there, unapproachable, they couldn't get to, lived in a place too hot, too bright. Yes, indeed, he is the immortal one who lives in unapproachable and glorious light. That he became a man, left that kingdom in order to come and save them, that they could now be connected with him and be his friends and enter into his kingdom. You see, they had in their spiritual life, they had it all out there. It just was mixed up and turned around. Because you see, Paul does say, praise to God, the only immortal one who dwells in unapproachable light. They knew that. The place where God dwells is too glorious and too bright for a mere human being to be in his presence. But they didn't know the good news of Jesus Christ. And so they spent their lives in oppression in fear because they did not know the gospel. They didn't know the gospel. And that is why it's so important that we be about sending and supporting missionaries. Because you see, it's not just the Yanomamo people there in South America that don't know Jesus. There are people all over the world that live lives of oppression and fear because they don't know the good news that you know. They've never experienced the salvation that comes by it people around the world that like the Jews they thought it was based on what they had to do how exhausting is it to spend your whole life trying to appease spirits or trying to appease God trying to be good enough and you know what the people that live in oppression and fear you don't have to go to the ends of the earth to find them you can look across your street to your neighbors you can look at the people that you walk by at the store 
You see, in the book of, of 2 Corinthians, it says, we used to view Christ just with our human earthly eyes, but no longer do we do that. And we used to view everybody just with human earthly eyes, but no, because Christ has come, we want to see people through heavenly eyes. Is this somebody that knows who Jesus is or not? Because you see, we're all sent in our communities. And as a church, we want to be about sending and supporting those that are going out to reach those around the world. Because how can they call on one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So a twofold thing we're going to be talking about today and next week. One, for next week, we are all sent. We're called to be missionaries, be witnesses, be ambassadors in our current context. Because you know what? Yes, we live in America, and a lot of people have heard the gospel. But you know what? A lot of people have not heard it in a way that they really understand it. And you know, maybe you've heard the saying that you may be the only scripture somebody reads. And I'm getting ahead of myself because that's next week. That's near and dear to my heart. Because God has called all of us to be salts and lights in our context, to be missionaries here. And we're going to get into that more and more because that's what we're a beacon of light. But how, how, do, we, how do we kind of turn the corner? We, we want to be a church that is going into our communities and we, we want to be a church that is going to the ends of the earth as we send those that God has called out there. So, so how do we do that? Well, um, like Marcy was saying, over the years what Skiff has done is in our budget, okay, our global missionaries, our mission budget has been separate from our general fund, okay? And everything that goes out to the missionaries that you see on the board out in the lobby, that is something that is designated toward missions. Now, praise the Lord, year over year over the last 30 or so years, the church has given roughly half of what has come in has been designated to go out to our missionaries that are, that are out around the world, okay? It's a very important thing that we want to see God's word go out. And how that has been done is through this idea of faith promise. And we're going to get into that a little bit. But I thought as we wanted to explore it, what does the scripture say about giving? So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Okay, we're going to read two chapters here, okay? Because here's what I want to do, okay? What did Paul say about this? Okay, Paul's pretty high up there in my opinion, okay, when it comes to Christian scholars, right? Okay, he wrote, he wrote about um, probably more than half of the New Testament. Like, okay, Paul went on missionary journeys wherever he went. He lived as a missionary wherever he was. He ministered to Jews and Gentiles, whoever was there. He wanted to follow God's leading, and that probably took finances and money, and he also was the one who was kind of uh, sometimes given care of. These churches wanted to give money to help support the Jewish Christians that were in Jerusalem. So what did he say about it? Let's read Paul, and what we're going to do here is um, we're going to read through this, and we're going to glean a couple different things about giving. We're going to glean what it looks like, kind of like how we give, what it looks like. We're going to look at the why behind we give, and we're going to look at some of the results, okay? So if you're taking notes, okay, there's a page in your bulletin to take notes. Um, so what I would do if you're doing that, I'd like turn that maybe sideways, okay? And you can make kind of three columns. There's going to be more in the column of what giving looks like than there is about the result and the why behind giving. But you can divide that up into three different places, and as we go through it, you can jot down notes about it. So let's dive in and see what God's Word says about giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace of God that has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and most extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able to, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. So he's saying, look, the Christians over here in Macedonia, like they wanted to give to help those that were in need. Now, this is not necessarily giving to fund missions in this. This is giving to support the needs of others, okay? So this is Paul teaching about we want to give in a way that supports the needs of these people over here that don't have what they need, okay? So let's, let's look at this more. So he's encouraging these Christians in Corinth, okay, with the attitude and heart of the Christians that were in Macedonia. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. 
Just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. So there is an idea that there is this grace of giving, that as we are poured in, we pour out, and there is this, it's, it's a grace of giving that God has given us. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. So one of the reasons that he encouraged them to give is God is a giver. Jesus emptied himself and became poor for you that you may be rich. Therefore, I want you to give to meet the needs of others. Because again, the context of this giving is to help provide for those who didn't have the things that they needed for their daily living. Continuing on. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. So when it comes to our giving, God desires there to be a willingness to give. And a willingness according to what we have to give. Not according to what you don't have. It's not comparing to somebody else. It's this is what I've been given. God give me a willingness to give. And there's a willingness. Paul says, well then, complete it. Okay? Let's continue on looking at what Paul says about this. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the, at the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. So he's going back to when God provided manna, and they were all supposed to get about this much per person, and even though somebody seemed to gather a little bit more, they were trying to get this much, they had just enough. And the one that gathered a little less, they had just enough, okay? And whether that was because they just had enough, or I had a little bit extra, here you have some. You see, this giving that Paul is talking about is giving to meet the needs of others, so he says it's not about you not having enough. It's about sharing what you have so that everybody can be blessed. So when we give, we want to give to meet the needs of others. Continuing on. I thank God who put it into the heart of Titus, the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he's coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. And we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering, which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and show eagerness to help. We want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift, for we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. So what is happening? Paul is sending Titus and some others to say, look, Corinthians, you were excited to give to meet the needs of the Jewish Christians that needed help, okay? Of the Christians who didn't have enough and so I'm encouraging you to get that ready because we're coming. And when we come, we want it to be that it's ready for us so that it can be cheerfully given, okay? So they're going to send Titus and this other group of people there. And he says, I want when they get there, I want you to show them the love that you have showed us. Now, let's go ahead and skip ahead to the beginning of chapter 9. Continuing on with this thought. There's no need for me to write to you about this service to the saints, for I know your eagerness to help. And I've been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year you and Achaia were ready to give. And your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. He's like, look, I've been telling the Macedonians how excited you are to participate in this and to give to meet needs. And they got so excited about it, they want to get in on it too. So your enthusiasm is spurring them on to give to meet needs of Christians around the world around the place that they're at. But I'm sending the brothers to you in order, get this, that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but you may be ready, as I said, you would be. So I'm wanting, I want you to be ready, because get this. This is, this, this is where Paul's a little bit funny, I think. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. So he's like, look, you wanted to give. We've been telling these people you want to give. We're coming, so get ready. Because they're so excited that you want to give, they want to give too. And if we get there and you're not ready, we're going to feel a little bit embarrassed. But you know what? Y'all are going to feel a lot more embarrassed. Because we've been talking about your excitement and your enthusiasm. So, so be ready for that. Make a plan for how you're going to do this. Because, 
So verse 5. I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish their arrangement for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift and not one grudgingly given. So how do we give? God desires generosity and not to be given grudgingly. God doesn't need your money. He doesn't. Cattle on a thousand hills are his. Like he fed 5,000 men plus women and children with five loaves and two bread. Right? Five loaves and two fish. That's what it is. Two bread. Five loaves and two fish. Like, he doesn't need your money. God wants your heart. And so the challenge is to be a cheerful giver. And if you're at a place where you can't give cheerfully, if it's reluctantly or under compulsion, I think God says, don't. Let me work on your heart. Because he wants it to be cheerfully given. And then Paul gives this promise. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So God says, look, when you decide what to give, we, we come before God with our spouse and our family and say, God, what do you desire us to give? We want it to be cheerful. We want it to be generous. It's not to be reluctant or under compulsion. You're not forced to give. It's, God, you've given to me. What would you like for me to do? And we decide. That's what Paul says, that you decide in your heart what you desire to give, what God is speaking to you. Because God loves a cheerful giver, and he's able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having everything you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, and his righteousness endures forever. You see, there are promises in the Bible that talk about God providing for our needs, and those promises are often directly tied to, as you give, God says, I will provide for your needs. Now, it may not be in the way that we think what our needs are and everything like that, right? But God says, as you give generously, I can make all my grace abound to you so that you can abound in every good work and continue to be generous, to share with those that are in need. Because again, the context in this passage is about sharing to meet the needs of others. So we can see in our giving how important it is that our giving is meeting the needs of others. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So Paul says, as you give, God works to provide for you so that you can continue to be generous. Not so that you get everything you need and you can buy all this stuff and you can sit on all this wealth. No, God blesses so that you can keep being generous to share with those in need. So when we look at giving, that the result of it is that God blesses and God provides so that we can continue to be generous. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but it's also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. So the result of it is it meets people's needs, Okay, It results in worship of God because God is glorified as we give. And when people that need it receive it, they thank God for it. And God gets kind of double glory, right? As we give and as they say thanks to God when they receive the gift. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And their prayers for you, their hearts will go out because of the surpassing grace God has given you. And he wraps it up with this. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Why do we give? Because God is a giver. And we give because Jesus Christ is the indescribable gift that God has given. You're never going to be able to outgive God, ever. I dare you, try. Go ahead. If you want to, try. You're not going to be able to outgive God. He's already given you everything. That's why Adam read those verses at the beginning, right? That God sent his son, that Jesus is this indescribable gift. So again, this passage, when Paul's talking about giving, it's, this passage is not about giving to send missionaries. It's about giving to provide for the needs of people. Okay? And we see it at different principles that we, um, that we can put into practice as we seek to be givers. Let's, let's look here in Philippians. This is specifically Paul thanking people for the gifts that they have given him to fund his missionary journeys. 
Okay, so now this one, the context is giving to Paul as he takes the gospel uh, around the world. He says, your gifts are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. You know, sometimes we quote that verse, God will meet all my needs. You got to read the first part of that, right? Paul's like, look, as you give generously, God says he's going to meet your needs so that you can continue to be generous. Because again... God doesn't need your money. He doesn't. He's God. He could do anything. You know, Jesus is in the wilderness and Satan says, Hey, you're the son of man. Turn this stone into bread. And you know what? Him turning this stone into bread, that wasn't a wrong thing for him to do. What it was wrong was that, Here, take this in your own hands. Don't submit to God. Provide for your needs in your way, right? You don't have to submit to what God's calling you to go through. Just get easy button. Get out of here, right? That was what was wrong. God could do that. Like, he fed 5,000 people, plus women and children, with, like, five loaves and two fish. He d- I have a question, though. What if the boy wouldn't have given the five loaves and two fish? Anybody have an answer for that? I mean, could he have just as easily picked up a stone, turned it into bread, and started breaking it and giving it out? I mean, that seems just as hard as taking a piece of bread and, and just ripping and ripping and ripping and ripping and ripping and ripping, and ripping until 5,000 plus people are satisfied and there's leftovers. God doesn't need your money. He wants your heart. And he often chooses to work through his people. You know, I mean, well, God, why can't you just do some big thing to show people about your grace and your goodness? And God's like, your plan A from, to take the gospel into the world. Satan, had this, uh, Satan threw the same temptation at Jesus. Hey, jump off the temple. The angel will catch you. Everybody will be like, man, this must be something spectacular. But that wasn't the way of the gospel. It wasn't the way of the cross. You see, God doesn't need your money. He wants your heart, and he works in response to his people. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to wrap up some of this portion on giving, and, and we're going to make a little bit of application for us. Because you see, if you read throughout Scripture, you see that God is a giver, that Jesus is the indescribable gift, and out of the worship of our hearts, we want to give back to Him. Not just our finances, not just our money, but yes, that is a part of what we give back. Of worship of you, my whole life is yours, and that includes the money that I have. We see in Corinthians that they were giving to meet the needs of those that didn't have enough. We see in Philippians that Paul was thanking them for the gift that they gave that he could continue on in the ministry that he had to devote his full time for that. Because at times, Paul worked as a tent maker. He would work and he would preach. And then he would have gifts to be able to supply his needs and he could focus just on on the mission work. Okay, But in, in Timothy, at the end of the first book of Timothy, Paul says this about money. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you, Timothy, keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. And then he says this, command those who are rich in the present world. Would you know what? No matter where our income is in America... We're a very wealthy nation, even those that are, that are really poor. Like compared to the world and those that maybe live on a dollar a week or, or, or less than a dollar a, a week, God has blessed us in so many ways. And Paul says, look, don't put your trust in your riches. 
Don't put your trust in, your, in your, what you have. In fact, man of God, Timothy, you flee from those things and you pursue these things. And I, this is what I want you to teach. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. So when it comes to giving, Paul says this. Look, if you are wealthy in this world, okay, money is not the root of evil. The love of money is the root of evil, of many kinds of evil. And so Paul told Timothy, those that are wealthy in this world, command them to do good, to be about God's kingdom, to not put their weight of their trust into their possessions that they have because that's fleeting, but put, to put their hope in God alone to be rich in good works and to be generous. And that is what God is calling us as his people, to give to meet the needs of others, to give like they did for Paul to send and support missionaries. And so today, because we're focusing on our global um, uh, missions, uh, if we can have our, our ushers come on forward, we, we have a faith promise card. They're going to be passing these out, okay? Uh, so uh, Tom and, and Dan are going to be passing those out, and we're going to get there in, in just a minute or so, okay? So you've got time to pass them out, but go ahead and do it, go ahead and do it now because it'll take you a couple minutes, okay? So uh, while they're passing out our faith promise cards, uh, here, here's kind of a summary, if you took notes, maybe some of these things are on your notes, okay? If you didn't take notes, you can snap a picture right now, right? And you can get it, okay? So, kind of wrapping up those, those different things that we talked about on those three passages, why do we give? We give because God is a giver and the indescribable gift that is Jesus. In our giving, what does our giving look like? We decide in our hearts with God and with our family, God, what do you want us to give? God desires us to give cheerfully, generously, and willingly. He doesn't want us to give begrudgingly or reluctantly or under compulsion. And, and I would even say that if that's somebody's heart, I, as a pastor, I'd say, don't. Ask God to give you a new heart. And then he'll help with the giving. Because God desires it to be a cheerful thing. Again, God doesn't need your money. He wants your heart. The results of giving, God is glorified, both in our giving and in the thanksgiving that those who receive it express. God promises to provide for our needs. That idea of sowing and reaping, okay, is in there. And God says he causes his grace to abound in us so that we may abound in good works and continue in generosity. That's kind of a summary of what some of those passages taught. So, what does this mean for us? Okay, a couple so what's. Number one, encourage you this week. Read through those passages we talked about today. And, and number two, it's to give. Now, when we talk about how SCIF is set up for giving, we have our normal offerings go into our general fund, okay? And that funds everything uh, that the church does. It funds the building, it funds the activities, the awana, the outreach, all of those things, okay? Um, it funds your pastors. It funds, that's, that's the general fund, okay? And then what we have done here is rather than designate some of that money, okay, uh, some churches would say X amount of percent of what comes in, the church designates for missions. What, what Skiff has, what we have decided to do over the years is that we challenge the church to give money towards missions. It's a faith promise. And so if you see the card that you have, okay, the challenge that we have for today is what, do you, what is God putting on your heart to give to fund the missions that, that go out um, that SCIF supports? And so um, if you have your bulletins, okay, and I should have this here. Oh, maybe I don't. If you have your bulletins, there is an insert in there that talks a little bit about uh, what the faith promise is about. Let me come down and grab mine real quick. Maybe. That's what happens when you pull it out to use later and then you put it down somewhere you don't have it. Anybody have one I can borrow? Ah! Found it. Sorry about that. All right, so the challenge for, 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 for us all, okay, is to seek God, what would you have me give toward missions, okay, to send out the missionaries that Skiff supports, okay? And, and part of that is this is... 
this is not to take away from the general fund because that's the things that God is doing here in our midst. But God, how do you desire to grow our faith to be able to give to, to support missions? So here's the thing that, that you can do. If you have already done this in the past, then you're pretty familiar with this, okay? So what we, what we ask you to do is look at what you have given towards missions this last year and say, God, will you show me what I can give toward missions this year? God, will you give me a faith to be able to increase that? And so what you can do over the next couple of weeks is as a family, seek God, what do you want me to give? And you can write down the yearly amount and put it on that card. You don't, don't sign it. This is, this is between you and God. You're not going to get checked up on by an elder or somebody. What this does is this allows our missions committee to know how much money is, is in faith going to be coming in so that they can decide how it, how it goes out to our different missionaries, okay? So I, I ask you to look at that and ask, how does God want to use your gift to send and fund missionaries? Okay, that's what the faith promise is about. Now, we know that is not all that giving is about, right? Because in the scriptures, we see giving is also giving to meet needs. So our challenge and encouragement is there's giving for general fund and there's giving for designation of missions. And the faith promise, designating for missions, helps our missions team know how much is coming in. So I challenge you to, to look at that and go, God, what would you have for me to give? Now, if you are new to this, what, what we would uh, encourage you to do is determine how much you gave in the last year, okay? And continue to give 50% of that to the general fund, okay? And then the other 50%, take that amount and go, God, how much more would you like for me to give here? And ask God and seek God what he has for you, and he'll show you. We're going we're gonna, to, Lord willing, we'd like to have all those cards back by um, uh, the Bible conference on, on uh, November 21st. If you have any questions about that, you can talk to myself, one of the elders, or someone on the mission team. Uh, but this is a way for us to grow in our faith. God, I want to trust you to provide so that I can give to help fund the missionaries that are going out. It helps our missions team budget and plan. And we don't have faith promise cards for the general fund, okay? That would get too confusing to have both of that. But really, all of this is, God, you gave to me. I want to give to you. And will you show me what that giving looks like? Make me cheerful. I don't want to give reluctantly or under compulsion. I want to see this church thrive. I want to see the gospel go out to the ends of the earth. I want to see the gospel go to my neighbors. I want to see the gospel infiltrate this area. God, show me. And he will. Because, see, he is the giver. And no matter how much we give, we're never, ever going to outgive. God. And the final so what, as our worship team comes on up to sing our, our closing song, come back next week. Okay, be here next week. Because next week we're going to talk about that other wing of, of the Great Commission, that global missions. And we're going to have a challenge of how God wants us to step out in faith to live as missionaries right here. Because we're called to be missionaries. And we're called to send and support missionaries. We're called to be a beacon of light to be a loving, growing, going church. So you pray with me. Lord, I thank you for your love and your grace. I thank you for your compassion and your mercy. Jesus, I thank you that you are the indescribable gift. God, we seek you. God, what do you want us to give? What do you want us to give to the general fund here at the church? What do you want us to give to send missionaries and, and, and to put that down to help our mission team be able to, to plan for this year? But God, you have poured into us that we may pour out into others and may our financial giving be one of those ways that we do. Find us faithful. Make us, truly make us more and more a loving, growing, going church. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.